Coming up on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour, we're talking about the science of searching for exoplanets with a couple of scientists from the Kepler mission. That's up next on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Dr. Kiki Science Hour with me, Dr. Kiki Sanford, episode 146, recorded on Thursday, May 31st, 2012. A disintegrating signal. This episode of Dr. Kiki Science Hour is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. I'm Dr. Kiki Sanford, and this is the show where you get to dig into a single topic in the sciences for an entire hour, or at least the better part of an hour. It's a lot of science, one topic, excitement. You might learn a lot. You might learn a little, but you can enjoy. And today, instead of having just a single guest, we have a special, that's right, two guests for the price of one, which, you know, because this is a podcast, it's absolutely free. So you get double the enjoyment from that. We are going to be speaking with researchers who are involved in the Kepler mission about the science of searching for exoplanets. We'll be talking with doctors Eugene Chang from UC Berkeley and John Jenkins from the SETI Institute. And that's going to be happening in just a few minutes when you're ready to get in and get dirty with the science. But first... A few science headlines. It's May 31st, 2012, and this is the science that made headlines this week. Amid both uproar and appreciation, 23andMe, a popular genetics testing company, announced its first patent this week on a genetic variant of the SGK1 gene that might be protective against Parkinson's disease for individuals with a rare risk-associated mutation in a gene called LRRK2. The company says that the patent is necessary for future drug development research. Sequencing of the tomato genome was completed and published in the journal Nature. Researchers involved in the project hope that it will lead to the development of a tastier tomato and boost conventional breeding over genetic modifications. In the name of healing everything that goes wrong in laboratory rodents, a Swiss team of scientists restored full range of motion to paralyzed rats. The rat's spinal cords have been severed to simulate spinal injury in humans within weeks of starting a regime of electrical and chemical spinal cord stimulation and robotic support. The rats fully recovered and are uh, described by the scientists as athletes. Human trials are hoped to begin in the next year or two. A paper in Science describes a computer model created to predict pragmatic reasoning in language, which is a step closer to computers that can understand human language and the complexities of inference, context, and social rules. The model is based on how listeners understand speakers and how speakers decide what to say, says one of the authors, Noah Goodman from Stanford University. Harvard University biologists published a study in Nature that analyzed fossils of bird-like dinosaurs and primitive birds to learn that birds really are dinosaurs, juvenile dinosaurs. Their study suggests that birds evolved as some species of theropod dinosaurs sped up their developmental pace. Instead of taking months or years to mature, birds very often take weeks, and physically they resemble the juveniles of their ancestors. SETI published its very first long baseline interferometric experiment in the Astronomical Journal, reporting no discovery of signals from intelligent aliens. Sorry, folks. The study used the Australian long baseline array pointed at the star Gliese 581 for eight hours in June of 2007 and found 222 candidate signals, but determined them to be from Earth-orbiting satellites. 
In honor of the Olympic Games in London, British chemists developed a synthetic molecule in the shape of Olympic rings. The molecule with five linked rings was imaged using non-contact atomic force microscopy and is called, wait for it, Olympocene. Everyone get ready. It'll be a great summer games. Volvo completed a 200 kilometer test drive of its self-driving road train. That's right. I was just going to say car, but no road train in Spain this week. The convoy of three cars were wirelessly linked to each other and followed by a lead via followed a lead vehicle driven by a professional driver. The test was part of a European commission project called Sartre. Safe road transit for the environment. Scientists in Ireland at the University of Limerick solved one of the most important questions currently facing humanity. Why, oh why, did the bubbles in a pint of Guinness sink to the bottom of the glass instead of just rising to the top? The answer lies in the geometry of the Guinness glass. The sloping sides of the glass set up a circulation where the liquid in the glass flows downward, downward near the walls and up in the center. The flow of the liquid creates drag on the bubbles and pulls them down. The team of physicists get points in my book for using the terms pint and anti-pint. And I kind of wonder if they ever met in the real world, would they anal- annihilate one another? These are the things you have to think about every once in a while. After successfully completing its mission to the International Space Station, the SpaceX Dragon spacecraft re-entered the Earth's atmosphere and splashed down off the California coast at 11.42 a.m. Eastern Time this morning. Congratulations on a history-making achievement, SpaceX. And in other commercial space news, the FAA cleared Spaceship Two to begin rockets, rocket-powered suborbital test flights. Spaceship Two is a six-passenger spacecraft owned by Virgin Galactic, manufactured by Scaled Composites. The permit allows Scaled Composites to fly only test pilots, not passengers at this point. But Virgin Galactic, Galactic has sold about 500 tickets for the $200,000 rides, the dates of which have not yet been set. And that does it for the science headlines this week. Let me know what you think about these science news stories or what you think should be news by emailing me, drkiki at drkiki.tv or leave me a voicemail at 650-741-5454. That's kiki, 741-kiki. This episode of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is brought to you by Netflix. Netflix streams thousands of TV episodes and movies directly to you instantly, saving you time, money, and hassle. And all three of those things, it's pretty great to save. There are several easy ways to instantly access Netflix. You can access the TV shows and movies that they have in their catalog on your Mac or your PC, your iPad, if you have an iPad app, iPhone, if you have an iPhone app, and even some Android phones as well. If you have a gaming console like an Xbox 360, a PS3, or Nintendo Wii, you can watch Netflix right on your TV. If you're not a gamer, you can watch Netflix on your TV using a set-top box like Apple TV or the Roku box. These are inexpensive and very easy to use. And with Netflix, you can watch all the movies and TV that you want instantly with any of these devices. And you can start on any one of the devices, stop at any point, and then pick up right where you left off on another device. It's a really seamless interface. I happen to appreciate it immensely, especially when I'm trying to trying to sedate my my toddler son with <laughs> with with toddler program programming. Anyway, whichever way you decide to choose to access Netflix, You can watch as much as you want, anytime you want. And if you don't like the service, you can cancel at any time for free. However, to get you into it, Netflix is offering a special offer for viewers of Twit, a free 30-day trial. It's a free 30-day trial. Go to netflix.com slash twit. Be sure to use this URL when you try and sign up. It's netflix.com slash twit, T-W-I-T. We would like to thank Netflix for their support of TWIT and Dr. Kiki's Science Hour, and we hope that you enjoy watching instantly with Netflix. 
It's time to get back to the show and into our conversation of the hour. I'd like to introduce my guests today. Dr. Eugene Chang received his undergraduate degree in physics from MIT in 1995 and his PhD in astronomy from Caltech in 2000. He's a professor of astronomy and of earth and planetary sciences and teaches a variety of classes in the astronomy department, ranging from introductory astrophysics for undergraduate majors to fluid mechanics and radiative processes for graduate students to graduate seminars seminars on galactic and planetary dynamics. The most challenging and most rewarding class he teaches is order of magnitude physics, in which the class tries to estimate any quantity under the sun to within a factor of 10. He also wrote a play in which the archive preprint server Cron achieves sentience. I think that's something I might like to see. Uh, and our other guest, Dr. John Jenkins is a research scientist for the SETI Institute at NASA Ames Research Center, where he conducts research on data processing and detection algorithms for discovering transiting extrasolar planets. He's the analysis lead and co-investigator for data analysis for NASA Discovery Program's Kepler mission. He received his PhD at Georgia Tech by studying the atmosphere of Venus with data from the Pioneer Venus Orbiter. He moved to the Bay Area after graduation in April of 1992 to join the SETI Institute as a principal investigator. In 2010, Dr. Jenkins received NASA's, NASA's Exceptional Technology Achievement Medal for his numerous technical achievements throughout development, commissioning, and operational phases, which have been critical to the success of Kepler. And I just want to thank you both for joining me on the show today. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. Yeah, it's Real great pleasure. to have you. It's wonderful to have you on here. And I am very excited to talk about the Kepler mission because everybody wants to know. I mean, the big question about that the, the Kepler mission is, is digging into is, are there other Earth-like planets that could support sentient life out there? Right? That's the big question. John? Absolutely. That's what we all want to know. And we all <laughs> can't wait to find the answer to this question. So I think we're all very fortunate to be at this place at this time when the answer to this question is just around the corner. I, how, how far around the corner really do you think we are? Well, I think we're within a couple of years of understanding the basic answer to the question, what is the prevalence or frequency of Earth-sized planets in the habitable zone of sun-like stars in our galaxy? That sounds... That that's soon. I like it. It I'm is. And <laughs> to be specific, when we say habitable zone, we're talking about that mm -hmm. range of distances from a star for which liquid water would pull on the surface of a planet. So we, we are indeed looking for worlds that could be Earth-like, but determining whether they are Earth-like is something that we have to leave to the next generation of astronomers and spacecraft and instruments. So tell me how you specifically got into the Kepler project. What's your, what was your path with working with SETI and then moving from studying, uh, studying Venus to studying extrasolar planets? Well, back as a graduate student at Georgia Tech, I uh, was working on data from the Pioneer Venus probe, um, the orbiter actually, to study the Venusian atmosphere and understand more about the sulfuric acid vapor below the cloud layer, which the cloud is made of sulfuric acid droplets. And it was about that time that I fell in with bad company. Bill Baruki was a co-investigator on Pioneer Venus, and he was studying lightning in the atmosphere of Venus. And he became the principal investigator and the chief promoter of the Kepler mission. And after I moved to Ames Research Center in 1992, I quite fortuitously uh, became involved with a small team of astronomers who at that time were trying to conduct a worldwide campaign to detect extrasolar planets orbiting the smallest known eclipsing binary at the time, CM Draconis. And while we valiantly worked hard for several years, about six years collecting data, uh, we did not detect any planets, although we set strong upper limits on the size of any planet in that system. And that work brought me to the attention of Bill, who invited me to join his team in 1995. And so from that point forward, my job was to develop and design the processing algorithms and the pipeline that we use to process the data to change pixels into planets from Kepler. 
I love that. I love that quote. I've seen, um, I've seen it other places around the web in relation to you, the idea that you're taking pixels and turning them into planets. How, like, how do you make that leap? Well, it's actually very simple in terms of the concept. What Kepler does is it stares nearly continuously at a fixed place on the sky that's about the size of the palm of your hand held at arm's length. So we're staring at 100 square degrees of the sky, one four hundredth of the total sky, and we're observing 156,000 or so stars simultaneously. And all we're doing is snapping images of the star field every six seconds, and we add those images together for half an hour. And once a month, we download just the postage stamps containing the images of each of these stars to the ground where we actually then can process the data. It's mm -hmm. a lot of data, and we can't afford to store the entire field of view, the full image, which has about 95 million pixels in it. So it's kind of wow. like taking your high school yearbook and just cutting out the portraits of your friends and pasting them onto another page and then throwing away the rest of the yearbook because that's all the stuff you're not interested in. And so that's where the, I'm sorry. I was just laughing at the, oh, okay. at the, at the so, analogy there. It's kind of funny. <laughs> right. So that's where the real work begins because mm -hmm. at, at that stage you have the raw pixel counts, just the raw image uh, from the CCD, which is uh, we have a focal plane composed of 42 CCDs. These are charge couple devices similar to those in your cell phone or digital camera. Ours are a little bit bigger than yours. A uh, normal cell phone has one about the size of your thumbnail. Ours are each one inches by two inches across. And <clears throat> we have a number of calibration steps we have to perform to remove on-chip artifacts and perform various calibrations that are common to ground-based astronomy, and some of which are, are unique to Kepler. For example, we operate without a shutter, and it takes a half second to read out the image. So we get these vertical smear trails up and down our CCD on the image, and we have to calibrate and remove that effect before we can measure the brightness of each star. And that's the next step. We basically accomplish that simply by adding up the, the counts or the voltage on each pixel corresponding to how many photoelectrons were collected during that half-hour integration. So it's mm -hmm. just numbers. We just add them up. And at that point, you have in each half-hour interval a measurement of the brightness of that star. Now it gets really interesting because we're looking for very weak signatures. Indeed, uh, when an Earth-sized planet crosses in front of a Sun-sized star, the drop in brightness is the ratio of the area of the planet to the star. And Earth is about 100 times smaller than the Sun by radius. So we're looking for a drop in brightness that's about one part in 10,000, or a percent of a percent. And that's a very shallow signal. It's very weak. So we have to do a lot of work and effort to identify and remove instrumental signatures that might be... Um, competing with mm -hmm. these shallow transits for attention by our software. So once we have done that, remove the instrumental artifacts, then we actually comb through the data with an algorithm that sifts through it, looking for instances where you have a periodic drop in brightness corresponding to a Keplerian clock, a planet crossing in front of a star uh, periodically and regularly, or it could be an eclipsing binary. And we have to then, after we detect such signals, then validate them and understand whether they're likely to be due to a planet crossing in front of a star or whether it's more likely that it's due to a small star crossing in front of a larger star. So that's the back end of the process is to construct a suite of diagnostic tests that mm. examine the evidence and allow us to have either more or less confidence in the signature in terms of it being a planet or not. Right. So and that's, actually, that's the full life cycle of pixel to planet. <laughs> and actually, it's just be, the idea that you can actually pull out the the existence of a planet out of that kind of uh, information is still rather mind boggling. Um, it is. Eugene, yeah, Eugene, can you tell me a bit about how you got involved in the in the Kepler mission? Oh, everyone who's interested in planets is involved in the Kepler vision uh, mission in <laughs> some way. It's, I mean, it's revolutionary. It's amazing to live in a time when you can actually tell people how many Earth-like planets there are uh, in the galaxy and have data back you up. Uh, John noted correctly that 
in a few years, we will have the answer. Although with the Kepler data already, if you were a betting person, you would you can already extrapolate the answer. The answer is that they're everywhere. That there's if I point to some random star in the sky, uh, provided it's a sun-like star, it has an order unity probability, some ten you percent, twenty percent, thirty percent probability of having a, a planet just like the Earth. Well, at least the size of the Earth in an orbit like the Earth uh, that is capable of sustaining liquid water. So everyone who's interested in planets. Uh, is paying very close attention uh, to the Kepler results. And then, and then you became involved in actually looking through the data and not, you're not just paying attention to the results, you're actually interested in some of the stories that the data can tell. Yeah, absolutely. So, so for this particular project of a disintegrating planet that I think will be the focus of today's episode, the way yeah. I got involved was through uh, a colleague uh, Saul Rappaport, and former mentor, actually, uh, from MIT. And he called me up one day just a few months ago, I think in December. Uh, I was grading papers at the time, grading exams. And uh, he said, have I got something from you, for you, to look at from the Kepler data stream? It really puzzles me. I don't quite, uh, I'm not sure exactly what it is. I have a few ideas, but I'm not completely sure. I'd like to talk about it with you. I kept telling him that I was uh, grading papers with my TAs and I needed to get back to it. He seemed to ignore me. It was really, really irritating. Uh, but that's but that's how I got involved. <clears throat> that's how I got involved. Um, it was through a phone call. And after I was done grading papers, I looked at the data that he had given me, this uh, light curve of this particular Kepler target, and it just blew me away. I'd never seen anything like it before. So that's how I got involved. And you said, I want, I want to look at this more deeply. I want to actually analyze this. Well, I want to know what the heck it is. Yeah. Uh, that's what everyone wants to know. No one could agree. Uh, there was no real consensus on what it, what, it, what it was. The light curve was bizarre, uh, bizarre in several ways, one of which is that it, it varied from uh, eclipse to eclipse. One time it would dim out, the star would dim by 1%, and then the next eclipse, 16 hours later, it would dip by half of that. And then a few eclipses down the road, you wouldn't even see the eclipses at all. They would just disappear. So it was very erratic and strange. Uh, there are other peculiar features that we can talk about too, but, but that's the one that's, that's most striking. Yeah, and so when something is that erratic, how do you, how do you pull out the, the, the constancy of it, which is that there is a planet that's orbiting around its star, but there's something odd about that planet? Oh yeah, the, the the constancy of the period is is uh, is well established. It's fifteen point six eight five hours from eclipse to eclipse. You can time it. Uh, uh, you can set your you know you can set your uh, set your watch by it. It's it's that precise. Um, but what isn't precise is the depth of the eclipse. How much the star dims uh, from transit to transit, uh, and that can vary by one percent. Uh, to a maximum of something like one and a half percent to less than 0.2 percent. Um. So, um, John, I was wondering, uh, for the, the construction of the light curve and getting this erratic information out of the data, where did... What, what actually happened to, um, to kind of come up with this signal that Eugene ended up getting his hands on and going, what is it? Well, it actually happened automatically. Our system analyzes all of the data in a hands-off fashion and conducts the search for transit-like features. And what's very interesting about this particular light curve is that it is so bizarre, as Eugene just said, I've never seen another light curve like this. There are plenty of weird, bizarre stars out there doing weird, wacko things. And some of them actually sound really good when you play them through a sound card. But this one is just off the charts. And a very interesting point about this is that our transit detection software automatically detected the signature of this transit or eclipse-like feature each time we ran it on the data. But when the humans in our in our science team and our science office went through these 
stars, this list of stars with transit-like features, they saw that this was not behaving like an ordinary planet. And so it was discounted. It was just set to the side and ignored until Saul Rappaport and his team picked it up and said, what the heck is this? <laughs> and in fact, the first question they had for me was, they came and talked to me, John, is this real or is it some instrumental glitch that's happening? We'd really like to believe it's real because there's got to be something novel, new here that, that begs for, for attention from, from astrophysicists. But until we know it's a real signal, then we don't know what to do with it. So uh, that was the role I played in this particular discovery was to conduct a suite of diagnostic checks against uh, instrumental effects that might be causing this signature in the light curve that is so compelling and interesting. So, for example, we looked for whether there was uh, a star likely to be in the background that might be an eclipsing binary or some other weird variable star. And we do that by looking at the apparent motion of this star on each frame over time to see if there is a correlation between the change in the brightness of the star and the apparent location of the star on the CCD. And uh, that proved not to be the case. So at the, the source of this intrinsic variability, if it's not this star, it must be so close on the sky to the star we can't tell from the Kepler data. We also looked for whether we were seeing a video crosstalk. Because we have a mosaic focal plane, it means that we're reading out CCDs simultaneously. And because all the electronics are, are close together on these 16 or 18 layer circuit boards, you can get crosstalk or, or signatures or signals from one amplifier on the output of a CCD getting into the video chain and getting uh, injected or added to the readout of another CCD. And this happens largely on each module, which has four readouts, four channels being read out simultaneously. And the good news is that we know exactly which pixels affect which pixels on the other CCDs, and we can yeah. do a visual inspection on a full frame image to see whether there's a source that's likely to be um, crosstalked or likely to be contaminating the light curve that you're looking at. And that proved not to be the case either. In fact, we looked at everything we could think of. We looked at whether the cosmic ray detection algorithm was finding cosmic rays preferentially in transit or out of transit. And it was not. So it passed all the checks that we could think of. And that's when Saul and his team and Eugene really went to work once they had confidence that this was an intrinsic variation in the light output from the star and not something that was due to something happening funny on the spacecraft. Yeah, yeah I'd is... only learned about it. Oh, sorry, sorry. Go ahead, Eugene. I, Go ahead. I just wanted yeah. to, to, to follow up on that. I, I, I had only learned about the source after John had done all this exhaustive series of checks. As a theorist, you're really grateful for, for all these uh, data analysis checks to confirm that the signal is real. But I can't tell you how many times I've worked on things that later on turned out to be wrong, to, to, to be false. Not mm -hmm. from any fault of my own, but from the fault of the observers. So, so this, was, this was the case that was not like that. Yeah, I was just, uh, the big story in the, in, in, Particle physics in the in the last year was the idea of faster than light neutrinos, which scientists came out and they they said we think we've got this really incredible result. We want to troubleshoot it and figure out what it might be, and then they went back to the drawing board and started doing all those checks. They started looking and looking and looking, and finally found out it was an equipment error. And so the faster than light neutrinos don't exist, or at least we haven't found them. If they do. Um, and so it just, this, this is a much, uh, much handier. It's a, it's a very similar tale, but just going to figure out, you know, okay, is this something, this is an odd result. Is this something that we've done wrong or is it actually something we should be looking at, looking into? Because the technology you're looking, you're using is pretty complex. Well, it is. And indeed, this is a very sensitive instrument. It's much more sensitive than any other photometer that's ever been built and launched. And we're extremely sensitive. So even what normally would be small, insignificant changes in the environment on the spacecraft and the telescope impact the data. For example, early in the mission, we noticed that there were oscillations that kind of looked like they were triangle waves and they were becoming more and more frequent over time. And we traced that back to a heater on one of the reaction wheel assemblies that was 
turning on to keep the reaction wheels in their proper temperature range. And that's critical to the to the operation of this spacecraft because the reaction wheels are like gyroscopes. They actually control the pointing of the spacecraft and the telescope. But when the heater came on, it was changing the temperature of this box on the side of the spacecraft by five degrees Celsius. And that was changing the shape of the telescope so that the distance between the primary mirror and the focal plane, which are normally 1.4 meters apart, was changing by 0.1 micrometers. And we could see that easily mm. by eye and the data at the pixel level. And mm. so normally a change by about a, a part in 10 million is something that you can afford to neglect as an engineer or in most cases as a scientist. Yeah. But in this case, it's a booming signal to this very sensitive instrument. So we have to be very careful and cautious when we see things in the data that aren't things that we've expected and, and learned to love or at least deal with. And now we've got this amazing story that uh, that you that uh, NASA has released. You guys have, have published uh, of this the tale, the dusty tale of this disintegrating planet. If we want to put a story spin on it, that this this odd signal that turned out to be some it, it is something actually there's a planet around a star it's real and it's odd it's disintegrating and can eugene actually maybe you should tell the rest of the story of you know what you learned what as a theorist you've been able to pull from that light curve and where you've been able to go with this story yeah sure so the first thing to note about it is the depth of the eclipse. So at maximum, it's 1%. Uh, that is, it dims the star's light by at most 1%. And John noted before, he explained before that, you know, the, the depth of the eclipse is, of course, related to the size of the object that's passing in front of the star. So in the case of a 1% dip, that's booming to Kepler, right, which is uh, uh, built to, be, to detect signals that are much weaker. Um, but 1%, that's a booming signal. That comes from a, would come ordinarily from a giant planet, one whose size is comparable to Jupiter. Hmm. Uh, so a really big one. The problem with that interpretation, that's sort of the obvious one that you'd first, you might first think of. The problem with that is that you, you have to get rid of it on the next eclipse because the depth varies from orbit to orbit. So 15.7 hours later, suddenly it's gone. So where did the planet go? You know, here, you know, at, in one moment it's there, and the other uh, moment it's not. So it's, it was it proved very difficult to move the planet over an entire Jupiter mass over out of the line of sight to the star. And we really couldn't figure out a way to do it. Uh, uh, we tried, you know, putting in another planet. Um, it you can put in other planets, but the changes that they would induce to a Jupiter-mass planet occur over much slower timescales, much slower than the orbit-to-orbit -orbit variations uh, that are indicated by the data. So you can't think of, we had to sort of abandon the whole uh, idea of using a single opaque body as large as Jupiter to explain the data. And instead, what we thought of was a wind, um, some, uh, a, uh, an outflow not a single opaque body, but a collection of dust particles being spewed out from a much smaller planet, a little nugget that's inside this uh, cloud of dust. And the cloud of dust is erratic. It's, it's, it's like a comet. That's the idea, uh, is that it's spewing out um, dust uh, erratically. There might even be volcanoes on the surface. Um, and the amount of mass that's lost is, is uh, prodigious in the following sense. It's about, it's, you can estimate it from the data. Uh, the fact that it occults about 1% of the light of the star, you could use that uh, in a back of the envelope order of magnitude esti estimate. Um, you can do this at home too. It's just a couple lines of algebra. Uh, you can estimate that it's putting out something like um, 10 to the 11 grams <clears throat> per second. Uh, which is about an Earth mass per billion years. Now, uh, that's substantial uh, in the following sense. If you believe that the mass is uh, that the mass of the planet that's spewing out all this dust 
Uh, we also we made a further estimate of how big the underlying planet could be, and we got an we got an estimate of something like a tenth. Okay, a tenth of an Earth mass. So if you believe that it's putting out one Earth mass per gig year, and if you also uh, calculate as we did that the mass of the underlying planet is not much bigger than Mercury. And the thing doesn't have very long to live. It only lasts for a tenth of a giga year, a tenth of a billion years, or about a hundred million years. Um, that's short. That's short compared to the uh, likely age of the star, which is probably measured in billions of years. So this thing is uh, disintegrating before our eyes. It's, it's expected to be a short-lived phase. Yeah, very short-lived. And do from from this, do we get an idea that there might have been might have been lots of other planets that disintegrated because they were so close to their stars and that we, while we're looking at solar systems, we're looking at that at, at stuff that we're missing. We're missing stuff possibly. Yeah, that's that's absolutely uh, a possibility. I mean, one thing that we're missing is all the objects that are that the, the orbits just like this one uh, actively disintegrating, but there's what there are certain numbers that we're missing just because of the unfavorable orientation of the orbit, right? So this one happens to be uh, the orbit is aligned so that you're looking at it edge on, so that it actually passes in front of the star. But what about all those actively disintegrating planets that uh, whose orbits are tilted this way, right? Instead mm. of viewing it at edge on, you're looking at it face on, and then they'd be disintegrating, but you'd never know because they, they wouldn't be passing in front of the host star, which is in the middle. So you're certainly missing that contribution. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a fun exercise to try to estimate how many of these things are out there. With just one object, unfortunately, the parameter space is too large to get a, to get a really uh, good estimate. But, but there are certainly objects just like this one out there. I'm, I'm, I'm positive on that point. It's just hard to be, uh, it's hard to be quantitative. Eugene, I also thought it was very interesting that this star might, the star planet pair may be very fortuitous in terms of the effective temperature of the star because you pointed out that the star is cool enough so that these particles can condense and survive long enough to create a, cos a, a cometary like tail that can obscure the star, and that it may be that a large number of these um, close in roasting Earth sized planets or smaller planets actually are evaporating, but that you don't get a, a cometary dust trail condensing that we can actually observe. Yeah, that's right. It's a little bit of a, it's a, we, we called it the Goldilocks, sort of just right. All the parameters of the system are just right uh, so that it's an observable effect. So what John is pointing out is that there are, there are other roasting hot planets also discovered mm -hmm. by Kepler. Um, uh, they're even hotter. I mean, so the effective temperature of this one that we're talking about is something like 2,000 Kelvin. I think translate into Fahrenheit, something like 3,600 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. There are objects discovered that are even hotter. And you'd say to yourself, well, they should be disintegrating as well. Well, they are. Um, there are a couple problems, though. The reason why we don't expect to see this kind of uh, bizarre light curve from those hot uh, other planets is for two reasons. One, the one that John just mentioned, it's too hot. So the dust, as it comes off the surface, just evaporates instantly in seconds. So it never gets a chance to obscure enough of the face of the star to pr produce an observable signature. It's too hot. Uh, another reason is that the planets, uh, these other uh, roasting hot planets, they're too massive. They're known uh, from Kepler to be a couple Earth radii. Right? So super Earths, uh, perhaps 10 times more massive than the Earth. And the surface gravities of those planets is just too strong so that uh, the amount of outflow that you get, yes, it's hot at the surface, but the strong gravity from these other worlds is just, is just so strong that the gas and the dust remains confined to the surface. Whereas this object, we think... Uh, the underlying planet is uh, not much bigger than Mercury, perhaps just mm -hmm. Mercury in size. So it has a low enough gravity that it can emit uh, all these particulates. 
there's someone in the chat room who is just wondering. Um, we we can look at the at the light that's uh, emitted or the the dimming of the light that comes from stars through the Kepler observatory. Can we also see accretion disks? Is there any accretion disks wouldn't be moving around in any kind of uh, a frequency uh, that could be measured? Or is that something that's picked up? I think there are CVs, if I'm not mistaken, cataclysmic variables. That is we white dwarfs. Several. Yeah, in the Kepler data data field, these are these are other sources. Uh, so white dwarfs that are accreting from companion stars, so-called cataclysmic variables. Uh, John just mentioned that there were a couple. That's right, and they have very beautiful light curves. The uh, you see periodic outbursts where the brightness increases several fold, and then you will see rapid oscillations of the light output as well um, due to waves propagating in the accretion disk. Uh, at least that's, that's what I understand. Um, <laughs> and so we, we can see those things, um, at least in some instances. Now, we can also, in some cases, see light reflected off of the planet. And typically we see this only in the case of a very hot, close-in giant planet like Hat P7b, which was observed and detected, indeed, uh, the year before Kepler launched, but it happens to reside in the Kepler field of view. So, of course, we put it on our target list. And when the planet crosses in front of the star, it drops in brightness by, the star drops in brightness by 0.6%. And the star is much bigger than the sun, and the planet is much bigger than Jupiter, but hmm. it's about a 1% drop in brightness. But when the planet swings around on, in its orbit to go behind the star, the, this planet is heated to about 2,600 degrees Kelvin. So it's emitting thermal radiation, infrared. Some of that actually gets into the optical bandpass that we can measure with Kepler. Hmm. And it increases the total brightness of the system by about 100 parts per million. And then we see that 100 part per million additional light from the planet wink out when the planet goes behind the star. And we can see that in the light curve without folding it, without doing much of any processing to it. So in some instances, we can see uh, light reflected from the planet. And indeed, there are uh, astronomers out there in the community who are actually coming through the Kepler data to look for instances when we have planets that don't transit their star, don't cross the star, but you'll still see, you'll still see this phase variation in the light from the system, kind of like seeing the phases of the moon, right? So there are people who are trying to detect, and they have detected, um, they're looking for brown dwarfs, and, the, and there are candidates out there for, for planets uh, detected via this technique. That's fascinating. I love, I, it's just so interesting that the thermal radiation can also add to the light, the, the brightness that you're getting. In, the, in this case, with the hot, uh, the hot Mercury. It's just such a small. It's such a small planet that it doesn't have that kind of addition. It, was there any kind of addition when it passed behind the sun, behind its star? There will be, but I think it, it's too low. Uh, even the mighty Kepler is not <laughs> quite sensitive to detect uh, the light from the warm dust. It's there for sure, uh, right. but but it's just too low in flux. With the with what you've figured out about this this Mercury planet, what kind? I mean, you obviously would not want to live there. <laughs> would not want <laughs> no, to visit. No. <laughs> what kind from the from the signature from the light? You've gotten the the size, the mass of the planet. You've got the um, the radius of the the dust cloud that is uh, being emitted and and being blown away from the planet as it orbits. What, what other factors have you, uh, and temperature, what other factors have you been able to kind of figure out about this planet? Um, well, we can, we can say a few things about the mineralogy of the dust that's coming off. I mean, what kind of dust is it? What is it made out of? And so we did an exercise where we looked at various minerals, uh, in particular, uh, the minerals that comprise the Earth's mantle. So the Earth's mantle, most of it is made up of uh, so-called olivines and also pyroxenes. So these are magnesium silicates. Uh, uh, it's magnesium, silicon, and oxygen in various combinations. And what was surprising to us uh, 
after doing this exercise was how different the vapor pressures are for these various minerals. And this was determined by experiments, experiments mm -hmm. in the lab. Uh, and vapor pressure is interesting to us because it tells you how, uh, what the lifetimes of these grains are. You need them to survive for long enough that they can transit across the face of the star and produce an observable signature. So mm -hmm. it was a real surprise to us to learn that uh, olivine, for example, you can take a micron-sized grain of olivine, a microscopic speck of olivine, and not too surprisingly, it's, it vanishes in seconds. And the evaporation lifetime is measured in seconds. But you take the same size grain, and instead of making it out of olivine, you make it out of pyroxene, suddenly, for reasons that I have to admit, I, I, I as an astronomer don't, don't quite understand, uh, this thing, this micron-sized speck of pyroxene can last for just the right amount of time, a few hours, uh, to travel across the face of the star and produce the shadow uh, that's required to explain the data. So we, our best guess right now is that, you know, it's, it's, it's the pyroxene that we're looking at. It's MGSIO3. We, we could even start arguing about chemical composition of this <laughs> uh, world, which is, which to me is mind boggling. I mean, 20 years ago when this whole field started, I thought, oh, well, we'll get some masses, we'll get orbits, uh, it'll make, uh, it'll be a heyday for the, for the celestial mechanicians, but not for anybody else. But now even the geologists are getting interested, uh, which is, which uh, I really love. I really love that, that aspect uh, of the Kepler mission is that it's producing such rich, uh, for such rich science. And are you I... saying, Eugene, are you saying, Sorry? That our, are you saying that our light curves are superficial? <laughs> superficial. <laughs> not sure. Not sure what we mean by that. <laughs> uh, you know. You know. It's only. Uh, you know. As astronomers, we can only see down to optical depth unity, right? So everything is skin deep uh, for in, in the field of astronomy. Right. It's just the nature of the beast. It's, but it's, it's not a it personal. Is a, but it is amazing that starting from a, a light curve information that's carried in the brightness of light that has traveled from a star to our observatory, that all of this information can be gathered. I mean, the, uh, the amount of, of uh, knowledge that allows this, this kind of hypothesizing and this kind of inquiry into, into exoplanets is, it's astounding all on its own. It is. We're, we're, right in the midst of a voyage of, of discovery, a grand voyage of discovery that I think in, in some sense you could think rivals the discoveries that were made in the, in, the, in the 1600s with the discovery of, quote, the new worlds. Well, we're doing just that, but we don't have to leave our, leave our homes or our offices in order to do this. We simply need to send out a robotic probe like Kepler to collect the data mm -hmm. that we need in order to do this. But it's every bit as grand. It's telling us something about our place in the universe how often is it that you find a planet like Earth around a common main sequence star like our sun? I think it's just fascinating. And, and this is a very good example of the variability um, of planetary systems out there that Kepler's revealing to us. We're not just finding out about solar systems like our own. We're also finding out a lot about planetary formation processes in general and about the, the wide variety of circumstances and outcomes of this, what still is a mysterious process. Yeah, very mysterious. And Eugene, in terms of uh, the, the, um, the other hypotheses that you were looking at, I mean, what's the, what's the chance that you, that this result, we've, we're saying that you've, you've, this is your best guess, this disintegrating planet from looking at the light curve trying to figure out what it could possibly be, get rid of all the other possibilities, the alternative hypotheses. And this is the best guess for, for what the planet is. Um, are there any other possibilities out there? What's the likelihood of that? Yeah, sure. That's always worth considering. We're not you know, 100% sure that our explanation is correct. Um, I frankly can't think of anything else. Um, <laughs> but... I should point out, uh, right, and this is and this is the good news. Um, the the idea that we have is has predict it has certain predictions which are testable, and uh, people are are we we've proposed 
to pursue these additional experiments. Um, one of these experiments is to measure the light curve at other wavelengths. So Kepler measures in the optical, and we would like to do it at somewhat longer wavelengths in the infrared. So maybe one to two microns wavelength. And you can do this uh, with the Hubble Space Telescope. So John and I were on a proposal. Uh, we should hear back, I think, in a couple of weeks, whether it was accepted or not, um, to look uh, with the Hubble Space Telescope at this source to measure the light curve at infrared longer wavelengths. And the prediction is, if, if it really is dust and not a single opaque object uh, that's obscuring the scar, star, if it's really dust, then, uh, and if it's micron-sized dust, then the depth of the eclipse should go down. Uh, you should, as you go to longer wavelengths of observation, mm -hmm. then you should see the dimming become less and less because, um, because the wavelengths that you're observing at are longer now than the sizes of the particles uh, that, are, that are scattering mm -hmm. the radiation. So w when that happens, the scattering becomes less efficient. So the longer wavelength you go, the more the eclipses should disappear. So we're, I would be super excited to see that happen, uh, yeah. to see that observed, to see that confirmed with the Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, we sent in a proposal. I, I really hope it's, it's accepted. Um, so, so you see, there are, there are testable predictions for this idea that we can, that we can use to, to move forward. I should also point out um, that you know, there's another prediction, which is that you know, for a Mercury-sized object, it's, it's, sort of a, it's sort of a negative prediction. But for a Mercury-sized object, you really don't expect, you can't, right, with today's technology, detect the Doppler signal, the Doppler shift of the star, the gravitational tug of the star due to this little tiny planet. Um, so we predict that if you were to look uh, with the best spectrometers that we have, the most sensitive ones that we have today, you really shouldn't see a signal. Um, and other people, the people <laughs> right next door to me, Jeff Marcy, who loves to to uh, beat up on every idea I propose. He, he's <laughs> going out with the Keck, Keck telescope now uh, with Andrew Howard, and they're looking for Doppler shifts for the star. So far, nothing, which, it, which is immensely um, gratifying to me. Right. <laughs> so, 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 okay, so, so. Right, so, I mean, it, it would be like, shooting fish in a barrel if this were a stellar mass companion. Yeah, yeah. In, it, in some of the alternative scenarios, and the fact that there's a null result indicates that it, it's either something much more exotic and therefore more unlikely, or, or, it, or directly supports uh, our hypothesis. Right. So there are tests, and we're, we're trying to pursue them. I think but that's I can't think of it. I can't think of any, any alternatives, though. <laughs> Despite trying very hard, maybe maybe somebody else, a graduate student or something, will be able to yes, someone will yes. be able to come up with an alternative yes. hypothesis that you yes. can test as well. Yes, well, yes. And that's the field the is open. That's right. That's the beauty <laughs> of all this because yeah. you have a, yeah. a, a new instrument like Kepler that's giving you an interesting and new and novel signature, and it's a bit of a of a mystery, a who done it, as to what's yeah. actually going on. So Eugene and his team. You know, I, I believe have come up with the most credible and plausible uh, hypothesis explanation for what's going on, and so far it's holding up. And uh, we'll continue that work until we uh, achieve good confidence that it's the best explanation and that we've closed the books on the others. But even if it turns out not to be the case, then I think we'll have learned something new, and it may point us to a new collection of, of questions with equally interesting answers. Yeah, well, my fingers are crossed for your time on Hubble and that you'll be able to move forward with the actual experimental observation, try and see if that will work. Um, in as, as we come to the end of the show here, I'm just wondering if we can do a, a quick wrap up. How many planets does uh, has Kepler found so far? Where are we in the count? Well, at this no? point, we have identified over 2,300 planetary candidates, uh, most of which still... Uh, await vetting and confirmation. Uh, we've confirmed over 60 planets, but we believe based on the statistics so far that at least 80% of those 2,300 are valid candidate, are valid planets. And mm -hmm. indeed, 
Uh, about 900 of those are found in multiple transiting planet systems where we see not just one planet transiting, but two, three, four, as many as six. And we believe with high confidence that at least 90 plus percent of those systems are real planetary systems. So uh, solar systems are not rare. They, they appear to be very common and they appear to be very flat like our own so that the planet's orbits tend to lie in the same plane on the same surface. And where are we going to be going with the with the next questions? Now that you've you've got this really interesting result, it's obviously going to be driving some new questions uh, as you even try and experiment to to confirm what you've got. Is there anything uh, any any new information that you've gotten that's causing you to look at the the data you get from Kepler any differently? I think that's for Eugene. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> Not sure how to answer that question. In, in, with regards to the disintegrating planet, or yeah, or, has the disintegrating uh huh, or more? Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, well, as a follow-up study, we are. Um, this is in in the. Uh, it's a theoretical study. We have a follow-up theoretical study, which is to calculate from first principles um, what the mass loss rate of this planet should be. Now, we esti- I told you before, we estimated from the Kepler data that it should be putting out about one Earth mass per gig year. And that's almost straight from the data uh, without much theoretical bias. But what we'd like to do is have a sort of first principle, starting from scratch, right? Uh, the problem was well-defined. If you take Mercury and put it uh, at 0.01 AU, so one hundredth the distance between the Earth and the Sun, you'd put it that much closer in, how long would it take to go away? And that, mm-hmm. I think, is a well-defined question. Um, it's never really been answered before because we didn't have, you know, reason to, to, to calculate it. Uh, but we're calculating it now. So it's a hydrodynamics question. Uh, it uh, involves thermal winds, um, radiative transfer. Uh, so it's a sort of follow-up uh, theoretical study that I'm pursuing now with a graduate student, Daniel Perez Becker. That, that should be really interesting, especially since we we ha- we've seen Mercury. We've actually imaged it. We've gotten a, a mission to Mercury, and so we have a lot of information about this planet in our own solar system that we wouldn't actually have in other solar systems. That could that could you know give more insight into into what you're actually looking at and what you come up with. Absolutely. Cool. Right, and, and further, we're also making new observations with Kepler. We also have the ability to monitor as many as 512 stars at one minute intervals, which will be very important for this object because being such a short period object with a nearly 16 hour orbit, the transit features themselves are very short and would benefit from the one minute resolution so that the modeling has more details that we can try to match up. So that's about to start actually. And I can't wait to I can't wait to hear the news and be able to be able to talk about it and tell everybody what you guys are learning. There is so much information. Every time I hear a story, talk with somebody who's working on Kepler, the amount of data you have, the amount of information that's coming out of this this mission is just massive and it's driving astronomy forward. It really is pushing us forward into into the future and our understanding of of where we are in the universe, what other things are in the universe with us. And thank you so much for doing the work on it. Eugene, both of you actually, both of you are passionate about planets. We'll start with Eugene. What is your favorite exoplanet? (laughs) Favorite exoplanet? Uh, (laughs) Well, I'll just say this one. It's, it's, It's an easy choice to make, actually. Uh, I hope it's. I hope it really is a planet. First of all, <laughs> I hope we're right. <laughs> but I, but I should say a lot of them, right? Can, planet yeah, candidate. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I should say the and the reason why um, I it's my favorite is because um, it really is, as John pointed out, a kind of a mystery story. It's the it's the kind of work I like to do best. Um, um, it's the most enjoyable, uh, is what I mean. Uh, mm-hmm. You're given something. And nobody can agree on what the heck it is. So it's your job to figure it out. And that's, uh, you know, I I can't think of uh, a more enjoyable way to spend my work day. So, yeah, so this particular Kepler target gave me that opportunity. 
And for several months and continuing, uh, I've derived great satisfaction from that. I just hope I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> we hope so too. John, do you have a favorite exoplanet? Well, now you would be asking a parent to choose their favorite child and name that child in public. So I'm not sure if I can do that. <laughs> However, I can admit that um, I'm particularly drawn to the smaller and, you know, cuter uh, uh, children that Kepler has produced. And certainly those that display a lot of character and personality like 12557548 certainly warrant a lot of, a lot of attention and a lot of uh, enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> and have you have, have you had the opportunity being at SETI? Have you had the opportunity to, to meet Jodie Foster? Somebody in the chat room is dying to know. Oh, um, <laughs> I have I have met the inspiration for the character Ellie Arroway, whom she portrayed in Contact. But no, unfortunately, I, I have not had the opportunity to meet Jodie Foster herself. That I think would be great the, though. <laughs> I know, but I think meeting the the inspiration for the character that's that's right up there as well. That's fantastic. Inspiring people abound and both of you uh, fall into that category. Thank you very much for, for joining me today and sharing the passion that you have for this research and for sharing the story of this disintegrating planet, I believe, which is 12557548. Is that right? That's right. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> I had that written down. I couldn't remember that. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for putting thank together you. such a great show. You're welcome. It was thank a lot you of fun. very much. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, everybody, if you are interested in more information about Kepler and the news that it is producing, the news of exoplanets like this dusty disintegrating one, you can find that information at nasa.gov slash Kepler. Additionally, there is a Twitter page, so a Twitter account at NASA Kepler. And there's also a Facebook page, which is NASA's Kepler mission. So Facebook, facebook.com NASA's Kepler mission is the Facebook page. So uh, I absolutely recommend favoriting those sites, checking them out on a regular basis because the, this is not the only story to come out of Kepler and there will be many more, especially since the budget for Kepler has been continued and maintained. Yay! We want this mission to keep going. Um, also, I just I want to thank uh, once again Eugene Chang and John Jen Jenkins for joining me here. If you want to find out more about either of them, Eugene, Eugene works uh, as a assist, as a professor at UC Berkeley, and John Jenkins is at the SETI Institute. And that's it for today. I am Dr. Kiki. This has been Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. And until next week, you can follow my pursuits all over the interwebs. I'm Dr. Kiki on Twitter, Facebook, Kiki Sanford on Google+. I have a YouTube page, which is Kiki Sanford also. And if you just can't get enough science in your week... There is more. You can also uh, find my show This Week in Science on the Twit Network, broadcasting on Thursday, 7.30 p.m. Pacific time as well. And you go, go to twist.org to find past episodes of that show. Go to twit.tv slash kiki to download past episodes of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. And on Fridays around noon, I do a Justin TV chat. Justin TV slash Dr. Kiki science chat. Look for the science chat. You will find me. Um, next week, we are going to be talking about the Venus transit, which we didn't actually talk about in relation to Kepler, but um, there is some, NASA is doing some amazing stuff with the Venus transit, and you will be able to view it through NASA. NASA is helping out with that. So um, go check NASA out. They're doing cool stuff. If you're interested in the Venus transit, it's not going to happen again for, I don't know, until. 2,117, something like that. So it's quite a ways off. I'm probably not going to be alive then. So I'm going to make an effort to see the Venus transit this next week. Um, if you do miss it, or even if you do catch it, next Thursday, we're going to be talking about it in relation to the Solar Dynamics Observatory. Next week, it's Solar Dynamics all the way. I was trying to get Camilla Corona the chicken on, but that isn't happening. It's going to be a scientist, which I think that'll be just as good. 
I'll see you next week. I really do hope that you come back. Thanks for tuning into my Science Hour. This week, all I ask is one hour a week, even though I have a lot more for you. And remember, I hope this one hour a week makes your world a whole lot more interesting. Now for your science meditation of the week. I'm in the cupola. Are doo, you in the doo, cupola doo, being doo, an doo, astronaut? Yeah. I'm being an astronaut. Doo, doo, watching the moon doo, rise. Doo, 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 doo. <laughs> Kiki's in tears. This is just a fade in between. I just lost that input. Okay. I lost Leo's uh, laptop input. I think he knocked the cord. <laughs> That's why the background disappeared. Oh, man, that was funny.